Hi, I'm Diane Neubauer, Du Yanzi, and I'm going to show you in Zoom some of the settings that I think are probably going to be the most useful if you just found yourself using Zoom to teach a world language online. So I'm going to go through the settings, some of which I've already changed. So you might even want to have this video window open on one half of your computer screen and on the other half open your Zoom account online and have the settings open. So if you want to change things, you can just based right off this video. Um, what I found over time was that there are so many of these options. It's very hard when you just get started to know what each of them does. So I hope to help reduce some stress and increase some effectiveness of using Zoom by showing you these. So um, I would say you're going to want to have that host video on. That's you, the host. Participants video, though, I'm about to try in a big meeting tomorrow where I have maybe 30 people joining. I'm going to turn off their video by default. This is to maybe help manage the bandwidth needed to keep that whole group online together. And then, as it says, participants can change this during the meeting. So they're able to turn on their video window and look at each other. And we can kind of test that way too. Like, when will my computer crash? Is it after 10 people have their video window open? I don't know yet. Um, so usually I teach gr groups with maybe eight connections by video. And that's usually not at all a problem for my very weak rural Wi-Fi system. Uh, but I had problems last Sunday with a bigger group. So we'll see if that works. Um, on the audio, if you want to let them use a phone or computer and be able to use the, either the phone or the computer mic to be able to hear them, that's what that does. Um, joining before host means if they log in, they can kind of wait for you to start the meeting. They don't have to like, keep trying to log in until you get there. Um, so that I usually allow that because I usually teach adults. There is also a setting where that you can, um, I'll show you when you schedule the meeting, you can also tell it if they can have a waiting room. So they can join, but then they're in this little place that says the meeting will begin soon. And so they're connected, but waiting for you to start it. That's maybe the best for a class with, with kids. Um, some of these about the personal meeting ID, I think just skip them. I've not found them to be necessary at all. Likewise, authentication of users and things. I, I don't see that as a real first need in using Zoom. I don't require a password or anything like that. If you're sharing a link directly with your students through a classroom management system or an email, I don't think you're going to need a password. Just let them click. And this one here is super helpful. So embed the password in the meeting link for one click join. So that simplifies the process a little bit. I just read someone say, her daughter tried connecting for, or, or maybe it was her own class she tried to connect with, and the school Chromebooks blocked the download of a very small Zoom meeting app. Um, so apparently you can tell them, instead go into your browser and you can get to the Zoom meeting through a browser. So I'm not quite sure how to do that, but if this fails, that might be the issue. You want to have them connect through the browser rather than through the app, the little short, short download that doesn't really install software on your computer, but it makes it possible for you to connect to that Zoom meeting. Um, again, I wouldn't add a password on this. Mute participants upon entry, though, big plus there. One of the things I think about a bigger class size on a Zoom meeting, you're going to want to have them muted first and then choosing to use voice. Um, and maybe even managing how many have access to using their voice at a time. There is also a typed chat window that they can share with, you can set it, either the whole class or just to you. And so that's another way that they can call back. They can also, if they're on video window, if they turn those on, um, they can do gestures, they can nod their heads, they can do things to show their answers there as well. But because it's not a classroom, the online noise can really quickly be distracting. So having them muted first by default, I think is probably the way to go if you've got a bigger group that you're meeting. I don't do anything with reminders. Ah, the chat. This is another one to consider. How do you want to run this? 
uh, allow meeting participants to send a message visible to all of them. I, th I think, you know, a lot of mature students should be able to handle this. At this point in time, being able to talk to the whole class might be helpful. You can shut that down if it turns out to be a problem. Maybe you're thinking, no, I just want them to be able to chat to me, not to their whole class. However you think is going to be better. You can also prevent them from saving the chat. You can save the chat yourself as the meeting host. Uh, but whether or not you want to have students save it too, you can prevent them if you don't want that. Um, private chat, that's another one to consider. Do you want them to be able to talk one to one? And, and you can apparently get a record of what they say in those private chats as the meeting host, so it's not permanently private. And you would want to, of course, tell students if you allow this to happen. Um, you can also auto save chats. I would do that. I would have it so that you auto save your, your chats. You don't have to remember, oh, right, I want to get that when I close the meeting. Um, so if you're going to use those chats for any kind of record of students' answers or anything, um, you want to keep that. I would say you don't want sound when students join or leave. Just turn that off. File transfer, whether or not you want to have files be possible to send, I'm actually going to turn that off now because I have a feeling my, my Wi-Fi bandwidth is strapped to capacity and I don't know if having the option to, to send a file keeps some kind of little thing running and, and demanding a little bit more off my Wi-Fi. I don't know if it does, but I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> so I can't send files. They can't send files. We'll have to send files another way if we want to. Uh, feedback, I don't really care about. I don't want a feedback survey afterwards. Um, Co-hosts, I would say probably it's going to be kind of an exception, but you may, if you have a more an older class, a more mature class, and you want to hand over instruction to a student leader at some point, that might be worth it. Polls are something I have just found out about. Um, you need to set up the questions in advance. And here's um, something that Nye Fenny said. I'm looking at my notes about what she did. Um, she set up a poll as like the little quick quiz five point thing at the end of class. And she was smart because I thought, well, you have to determine those questions in advance if you're used to an interactive class and you're used to co-creating your material with your students through the class period. You don't know what the questions are best going to be at the beginning of the class. You maybe know the topic. Uh, but she came up with this brilliant thing. So have the question one be true, false. Have question two be A, B, C, D choices. And then the students can fill in the poll using those answer options. And then you verbally say the question during the class period. You develop the questions on the spot. Um, she also said that you need to have registration necessary and that cell phone access to the poll. Um, to the Zoom meeting and then therefore the poll was better. It was bigger on screen than when I tried it from my computer. The poll text was really small and kind of hard to read. So cell phone access was preferable if you want to have a right, nice big poll. Um, anything else about that? The registration thing is another option in here. I think we're going to come across it as we go down. Um, so that's a little more advanced thing, to be honest. Something you could do instead of a poll would be that chat, that private chat to you. Students could give quick quiz kinds of answers in a private chat to you. And you could save that that way. Um, it might be a little more tedious to grade. Um, let's see, allow a host to put an attendee on hold. You, you would want this if you have um, something like um, Paulino Brenner, Brenner said this in a meeting last Sunday. Um, he does this because sometimes you have like maybe a guessing game or something and you want to have somebody wait outside the room for a minute while you decide something and then bring them back in. So that would be a way to do that. Let's see. Uh, show Zoom windows during screen share. Yeah, I want to be able to see everybody's camera on screen during a screen share. Now you see fewer video windows. Um, but you can flip through them and browse through. Screen sharing, um, I like using screen sharing quite a bit. It does seem to demand more bandwidth, um, but I have it set just for the host at this point. Um, and I don't really feel a need to disable it exactly. 
um, annotation. This is something I haven't explored. I think by default it's on. Um, so someone else is going to have to tell you about that. Whiteboard is can be really helpful if you do write and discuss, or what I call it, live typing. So you can use the text box feature inside the whiteboard and you can type. Um, so I do like having that and I do also auto save it so I don't have to, ref to remember to save it myself. Remote control. I'm going to turn it off again because now again you might want it on. Maybe you want to have a student be able to do something in your screen view, but um, I'm going to turn it off. Nonverbal feedback you really want if you've got a big class and you're trying to get responses from them. Um, so they have icons in the participants panel. I don't see that in my own teacher view, in my host view, I should say. So they'll see that in their own view. Um, so things like, I think, raise hands and there's some other options in there. Join different meetings simultaneously. I'm going to turn that one off because I can't be in two meetings at once. And I wonder again, maybe that's going to strap my bandwidth just having it available. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to be overly cautious and get as much out of my computer's Wi-Fi access as I can without dropping people out of a meeting. Um, allow remove people to rejoin. Again, I'm not planning to remove people. I'm not going to mess with that. A breakout room. This, this I have just experimented with once last Sunday in a big, big video. This was helpful. And um, I, at the time, I, I hadn't thought of another way to use it. Like, if you do a lot of pair work, of course, this makes sense. But I'm a very input-based teacher. Their output is kind of for assessment or for fun. Um, so you might want to do it for those reasons. Uh, but um, I found that the breakout room, this could work. Uh, if you have 32 kids in a class and you're trying to connect with them live, getting answers from 32 kids on video screens is hard to do. The video windows are very small. Um, it's a lot of chaotic noise. You can't tell who's talking necessarily. Um, they could do it non-verbally, of course. They could do a chat window to you about it, but that's hard to keep track of while you're live in class. Um, and so I thought of this. What if, what if you tried it? The breakout room can split up automatically into smaller groups. So what I was thinking, and what I'm going to try tomorrow, is set up the breakout room. You have to turn it on to have it be available in a meeting. And then you can either assign them in advance if you wanted, or they can be randomly assigned. Random assignment, though, there's a double check. You can move people from one small breakout room to another if you see a potential problem. So I'm thinking tomorrow I'm going to try to keep people in groups of about four or five, and have those groups go off into a breakout room for a couple of minutes, say hello to each other, and then pick someone who's going to be their answerer. They're going to be assigned a name as a group. So like in Chinese groups, when I played team games in a classroom, I would do things like, um, and of course I'd use Chinese words for this, but um, dragon, dog, pig, uh, rat, the, the names of the Chinese zodiac animals, those worked great. I've heard people like Spanish teachers use country names of some predominantly Spanish speaking countries. So those could be cool ways to do it. So the idea is you've got teams now and those people in that group report to their one classmate. And then you can say, okay, dragons, uh, give me three ideas for what could happen next. Um, okay. Uh, Sheep, tell me whether you think this one's true or false. Um, and you could do it so that that group with their point person uses, where did I go with that? The private chat feature. Um, if you have that allowed and you think that that's going to be okay for your students, that they won't abuse that, um, they could send their answers to one person and then their, their point person could answer. The other thing that could happen is um, you could just have them, because now they know their little group, you could just call on that one little group. So you've got four or five people to give you a choral answer, and you can hear, okay, I heard about four voices, so they're in. And then the next time you ask a question, you turn to another team. Um, and so you can hear them more readily. Let's say you really are in dire straits, and you can't have all their video windows open at the same time. This might be a way that team can turn on their videos to you or you can turn them on and you can get just their one answer. I hope that made sense. Um, 
remote support, um, I do not have that open. Um, I just turned on closed captioning, but I found out um, that actually the closed captioning I thought was being added automatically in Zoom wasn't. It was because I uploaded to YouTube and YouTube can automatically caption English. Oh, well, so I don't need to have closed captioning available inside Zoom. Um, I wanted to be able to share with deaf friends who teach ASL um, these little videos. So still have that option just because I upload it to YouTube and it has that automatically. Um, captions. Yeah, this is, is off because closed captioning just got turned off. I don't want to control anybody's camera. Virtual background. Now you can turn that off for others. So you can upload an image and put that behind you. With a green screen, it works great. Without a green screen, it's still a little less stable, but it still works. Uh, I'm going to keep it open, even though I think it demands some bandwidth, just because it's super fun and because I'm going to use it to do a movie talk kind of modification in uh, tomorrow. Let's see, anything else down here? See how many settings? Like, I was just blown away by this, but I've been using Zoom for three years, and now I know how I want to use it. And like, oh, this could do that. Um, so over time, you start to find tricks that work for you. Let's see, yes, yeah, stereo audio, that's fine with me. Attention tracking. Maybe something if you are needing to ensure that students are tracking the video that you've provided, or not the video you've provided, the live class video on Zoom um, so that they don't have another window open and are actually doing something else. Um, so if you have that situation, you might want to do it. I'm not going to turn it on because I don't need that. Waiting room. Um, this would make it so that every single meeting you ever had has this waiting room and only when you manually add them individually from that waiting room can they join your meeting. I would not want that on every single meeting. You can set it meeting by meeting in a different location in the settings. Uh, let's see. This cloud recording on Zoom, I'm hearing it's really taking a long, long time. I save my Zoom video files to my computer hard drive first, and then I upload them from there. And I think it's sounding like it might be preferable for others too. Um, when they join the meeting before host, get a notification. Yep, I get an email. I think that's worth having on. You want to know if somebody just showed up to a meeting. Um, you know, they may be just checking to see that the settings work, but you might want to know that they're there. Um, do, do anything else of interest down here? I'm going to say no. So there we go. Um, those are the big things. Now, something that's not in this Zoom website for a setting is that all that green screen fun stuff. Um, so maybe another video some other time about that. Although I do have one that shows what you can do with green screen as a kind of language teaching tool. Um, so there's another video about that. Um, and then there's also a longer video where I'm meeting with a whole bunch of people online and talking about some of the basic ways to use Zoom during a class session. Um, so blessings to you, be well and at peace and um, enjoy getting to experiment with these new tools.